Hey, thank you so much for checking out today's video. I'm Pastor Matt, this is Pastor Adrian, and we pray this message blesses you and encourages you all throughout your week. Absolutely. For any more information on how to be praying with us or to become a part of our community or to give, please head on over to takeovergera.com. Oh, come on, somebody. Jacob, you handsome saint, you. Look at the gale. Give it up for Jacob back here. His fingers are bleeding uh, from crushing that so much. Thank you, sir. That was a terrible Jim Carrey impression. Oh, man. Hey, good morning. Oh, oh, come on, church. Come on, church. Who is grateful to be found in the house of God this morning? Oh, yes. Come on, baby. Man, the church is not the place to get shy. Amen. The Lord says he rides in on the praises of his people, amen. Church is the one place that you don't show up dignified to, friends. This is not a house for the dignified, it is for the justified, amen. Come on, somebody. And if you've been justified by Christ, you got something to praise God about, amen. So, how about you exercise that? Let him ride in on the waves of your praise and praise him one time. Come on. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Wow. Well, hey, this morning, hey, if I haven't a chance to meet you yet, uh, first time here at church, I'm Pastor Matt. My beautiful wife, Adrienne, was rocking uh, prayer earlier. We're the lead pastors here at uh, Takeover Church. And uh, yes, West Michigan, there's a female pastor. We have a few of them, actually. It's awesome. So did Paul uh, and Jesus, and you should just read the Bible. So anyways, um, it's, it's really good. Well, praise God that you're found in the house of God. Um, but today is going to be another incredible Sunday, I hope, as we continue our series, The Wilderness. Was anybody blessed last week, week one? Come on. Was anybody challenged last week? Was anybody tested last week? Was anybody mad last week? No, don't, 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 don't. Because I'll get real stoked that you was mad about it. Um, <laughs> But man, yeah, we're going to continue our series, and, and honestly, in just a moment, we're going we're gonna, to uh, we're gonna recite a prayer together, um, and, and our amazing uh, Kelsey will throw that up on the screen, um, give it up for Killer Kells in the back, uh, holding it down, give it up for uh, my man Phil in the back, holding down the sound booth, come on, oh man, that worship sounded so, so good, and it was because they was holding it down while the Lord was moving up here, amen. Uh, but in a moment, we're going to recite this together because it's our heart and our prayer that through the season of the wilderness, we would be a church that would be united, that we would have one voice, one heart, one cry in the wilderness, that we would allow the Lord to quench us and fire us in the wilderness and to set us apart for a great move of God in the city of Grand Rapids and beyond. Amen? Come on. So if you are not interested in revival, I am not the pastor for you, and this is not the church for you. If you are interested in revival, we will give our lives for this. I will give my life for this, and I invite you to come along for the ride. Amen? Come on. Well, hey, speaking of giving our lives for something, uh, Scotty, hey, great, great offering message. Um, that was amazing. I want to share this quick thing with you real quick. Um, anybody else love their Latin in here? We got any Latin aficionados? Um, man, there's something that the early church um, confirmed. Our old, our old school uh, monastic mothers and fathers, the church who, um, back when Constantine, this is 300, uh, 300 A.D. after Christ, um, Constantine was our first, um, what do you want to call him, like Roman Caesar Empire ruler. He's the first one who was a Christian in that time in the world, which is crazy uh but at the a, a, as you know because we've 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 lived through the last you know 20 years of politics in america uh as you know uh when christianity and politics begin to mash um man so often uh something be, tends to lean more towards the the political side of things and less towards the christian side of things amen um and that's just the reality trust me i'm a conservative hear that okay I'm simply stating caution. But what happened was, was the, the monastic mothers and fathers, they got so worried that Constantine's political endeavors began to infiltrate the church and began to uh, pollute the word of God that in order to preserve the Bible, in order to preserve the gospels, in order to preserve the written word of God, they left civilization for 30 years and they went out into the desert. They went out into the wilderness. Hello, how great is this? And they, they came up with these phrases. And, and I really want us to, to attach ourselves to these uh, in this season. Does that sound good? 
First one is the church militant. You may have heard this in like the Nicene Creed um, when you're looking at church history. This is the church militant, which is uh, Ecclesia Militants, which stands for, are you ready? Soldiers of Christ. The soldiers of Christ. We are the church militant, the Ecclesia Militant. Ecclesia means church in Latin. We are the church militant militant we are the soldiers of christ so i got any soldiers of christ in the house yeah. come on somebody and this is way better than like early 2000s christianity t-shirts okay this is real okay i'm not talking dog tags and biohazard signs we know the t-shirts i'm talking about you do don't, don't play games with me i know somebody out there had holy spirit but it looked like it said lemon lime sprite i know you did or reese's but it says jesus like i know you did and then there's another one are you ready for this one this is where i want us to land church Penitent, the Ecclesia Poen. There's somebody who can do uh, Latin here way far better than I can. Uh, po Phil, uh, Poentens, uh, P O E N I T E N S, which simply means, are you ready for this? The church expectant. The church expectant. The church expectant. But it's funny, before they would say the church expectant, they would use this other phrase, ecclesia dolens, the church suffering. The church suffering. I want us to be the church militant in our city, in the cities that surround us. I want us to be the church dolens when we are going through it. And I want us to be the church potents. And we want to be a church of great expectation even so much so this morning, one of our amazing team members was like, hey, do you want to put some of these chairs away from Easter? And I said, no. I'm tired of setting up for what I think is going to show up. I want to set up for what I want God to do. I want God to fill this house. I want you to invite people to church. I want you to get out in your neighborhood, your neighborhood and start loving on people for the cause of Christ. I want to partner with you. I want us to raise up Christians in Grand Rapids that are found like Jesus. Where are they? They're at their father's house being about their father's business. Amen? And we're going to bring everybody with us. So next week, invite two people. Invite five. This is a challenge from your pastor. And I mean that. I don't know why someone left, but I mean that. So we're going to read this prayer, and then we're going to get to the scripture. Sound good? Y'all ready? Come on. I got any justified people in the house? Yeah. <laughs> Just checking. A prayer for the wilderness. Let's go. God, Make me a voice in this generation. God, make me a shepherd after your own heart. I want to know you for real. I want to burn with your holy fire. I want to feel what you feel. See how you see. And move like you move. I open my heart to you. Release upon me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of your son. Set my heart on fire. Set my heart on fire set my heart on fire make my life a life of prayer and all God's people shouted come on somebody <clears throat> yeah I'm gonna cry I was crying during worship uh, y'all got me messed up oh man okay well this morning we're going to hit scripture in just a second. The title of my message this morning, are you ready? Who's taking notes? Where my note takers at? Where the blessed folk at? There we go. Love you. Also, evidently, my tongue is not great at enunciating the L in that word. Um, so I'm going to not say folk ever again. <laughs> but the title of my message, if you're taking notes, is the word in the wild. The word in the wild. The word in the wild. Would you just turn to your neighbor and let him know you got a word for him? All right, and then your neighbor needs to hold you to that. You need to have a word for him after service. 
No, I'm just kidding. Would you turn to your other neighbor and say, hey, I like you. Please stick around. Why can't we be friends? Fantastic. All right, well, if you're a Christian in the house and you got your Bible, you can turn it on or you can open it up. And you go to Matthew 14, 22 through 33. It'll also be up on the Sky Bible. So Matthew 14, 22 through 33. Are y'all ready for the Word of God? Y'all love your B-I-B-L-E? Come on. How many of you know the B-I-B-L-E is what? The book for me! Come on. I didn't even grow up in church, all right? And I knew that one. The CRC folk are like, bro. Um, that's why they were quiet. They knew it, but they just didn't talk in church growing up. So, um. All right. Uh, you got to email me any discrepancies at John MacArthur. At, uh, anyways. So Matthew 14, 22 <laughs> through 33. Here we go. Immediately. Somebody say immediately. 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 Come on. You're awake this morning. He made the disciples get into the boat. I love when the Lord makes me do things. Get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Somebody say to the other side. Well, he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up. Somebody say went up. He went up on the mountain by himself to pray. I don't know why a hip-hop song popped in my head. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land. Beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. Somebody say against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart. Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat. He walked on the water, and he came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. Somebody said, Lord, save me. You in now. Ain't no getting out. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat and the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. We're going to pray, and we're going to see what the Lord will do with that. Father God, Father, your spirit is thick in this house. Father, we are so grateful, Father, that you are here, that you have met with your people. God, we want to be a place where uh, absolutely people show up. Make Make no bones about it. Our heart and our cry is that we would be an effective church, reaching people, reaching the lost, edifying the church, God. Build your house. Fill your house, God. Fill this place, Father. But more importantly, God, we are setting apart a home for you to come. Father, we will be your resting place. Father, we will be your footstool. Father, if you asked it of us, we would be the wash bowl for your feet as long as you come. So, Father, thank you today. We'll be your your wash bowl, God. Father, if you would just come, if you would just fill your house, if you would just meet with your people, God, we don't care what the job is in the city, God. We don't care if it's flashy. We don't care if it's hidden in the wilderness, God. If you would come, we would even be your washbowl for your feet, Father. Just come and rest on your people. Come and set us on fire, God. God, turn and Fix our eyes on heaven today. God, we open ourselves up to you. We lay ourselves before you. We get vulnerable in your house, God. And we say, come, Lord, have your way and make us like Jesus today. And a faith filled, ready to get after it. Church militant, church potent, church set. Amen. Amen. Come on. All right. I don't know where the whole thing happened and I don't know when it happened, but the Lord in like military it's a thing here i don't know when it happened but we got green shirts with grenades on it like it's fun um and i'm here for it like i didn't i didn't i didn't sign up for the church uh you know baking class i i I signed up for a revival um nothing wrong with baking you need baked goods at revivals ask the old church grandmothers we love them um 
but come on somebody we are here to see jesus take over people's lives amen so the word in the wild the word in the wild and this is truly this is more or less part two to last week and this is really this whole series for me uh, on the weeks that i'll be speaking are, are quite knitted together if you will the lord is really sowing something in me that i really hope i am able to impart to you and he just begins to sow within you and graft you together because friends right now we are entering the season of the wilderness if you weren't here last week check out part one uh, or the first ins installation of the message series uh, the wilderness this will make a whole lot more sense in the beginning but friends we're a church that we're not waiting we're not waiting on the call of God to go into the wilderness. No, we recognize we are a church. We are a people who are recognizing in the hour that we are in, in the earth, that the wilderness is needed, that the wilderness equips, that the wilderness isn't simply for the breaking, but it's for the building. Amen. And we are a church who are purposing within ourselves. And we're saying, here we are, Lord, send us. Better yet, Lord, we will run after you into the wilderness. We are a church that right now in this season is committed. I hate you. I hate you, AT-ATs. I hate you so much. Praise God for summer. We're done with these heaters. Amen. After today, please unplug them. Oh. But we are a church that is committed. Somebody say committed. Be louder than the machine. I got to hear you. Be committed. Come on, somebody. We are a church that is committed to the wilderness. We are committed to the process of development. We live in a time and a place right now where truth is lies. We live in a time and place where the world is dry. We live in a time and place where there is, the world is filled with the dead and God is asking, can these dry bones live again? And we are the church proclaiming, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And so this entire season is us saying, no, 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 no. The world is looking for a tried and true church. The world is looking for the bride of Christ to be the bride of Christ. The world doesn't know it yet. As much as it loves wine, it ain't had new wine like us yet. Amen. And we are committed to being grown and stretched and developed into the new wine skin so that new wine can flow. Amen. We are committed as a church, that we will be the hardened steel in this hour in our generation, from the old to the young, to the, for the seasoned saints and the new saints, the people still all far off from God, we will be fired and quenched into word and spirit, truth, church. Amen. Is there anybody here today that wants to say and proclaim loudly that you are committed to being quenched and fired in the word and spirit? Come on, somebody say amen. 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 Well, let's get after it. Come on. Man, the word in the wild. I look at this portion of scripture and I love it. I love this moment with Jesus and his disciples. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. I, I, I feel like as I was even bringing up the passage, as I was even bringing it up, I was, I was sitting there with the Lord, and we had a, a good three hours prayer session. Not that I'm more holy than anybody else. It's just part of my God-given calling. Um, I was just praying with the Lord, and we were sussing out Scripture, and we were sussing out where we were going and what He wanted to say and where He was growing me even, and, and, and it's a whole thing. And so as we're doing this, I, he, he points me to this very familiar portion of Scripture. And I know that as I sat there, at 5 a.m. and I'm looking at this and I'm just going, you know, like we read this and it's, and it's like, Lord, not only have I preached on this message, like this portion of scripture a thousand times, every pastor ever has preached on this portion of scripture like a thousand times, and I sat there just so familiar with the scripture, and I would guarantee today, even as I brought it up, even as I read it to you, even as you read where this was going, walk on water, Peter walking on water, you, some of us, we just inclined, and like reclined in our seat going, huh, well, at least worship was great. <laughs> oh yeah, he's, uh, well, I'm not going to hear anything different here. I feel like we can read this portion of scripture and suddenly, because of our familiarity with this portion of scripture, scripture, our familiarity breeds discontentment instead of covenant. 
our familiarity with this story breeds discontentment instead of covenant. Covenant meaning our relationship with Lord Jesus. Instead of growing us closer because of the familiarity with it, because of the faith that it inspires, because of what it does, what it says, what is possible with Jesus, it breeds this discontentment in us and we lean back in our chairs and we go, tell me something I don't know. I know because I did it. If someone would gracefully grab that door, that would be just the bee's knees and I would appreciate you so much. Alex, what an amazing servant. Come on. Praise him. But friends, I have a word of caution today as we go into this message. Don't allow your familiarity with Scripture to breed discontentment towards Scripture. Allow your familiarity with Scripture to breed new covenant life within you, between you and your Father. Don't allow this to falter, but grow closer to the Father. Amen? Alliteration. I'm a pastor. It's what I do. Seriously, though, familiarity will be fatal to your faith if it breeds discontentment and not covenant. Familiarity will be fatal to your faith if it breeds discontentment and not covenant. Am I preaching or am I preaching this morning? And I love this portion of scripture because I love Jesus. And friends, some of us this morning, out of our familiarity, it's easy to sit here and be like, well, I've heard this a thousand times. I, I, I grew up in a Baptist church. I went to Awana, okay? Like, I know what this is about. And we'll have this attitude towards Scripture for just because we've heard it a thousand times, we think it, we've thought to ourselves that we've gotten a thousand times worth of revelation. Friends, I'm here to tell you today, you can read the same Scripture a thousand times and you will not get all that it has for you. You can read the same one verse a thousand times and there is still wine left. There is still oil in the olive. There is still more juice to be squeezed because the word of God goes forth and it does not return void. So while this may seem familiar to you today, don't allow it to be fatal to you today. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? Come on, somebody. Let's lean into it. And friends, I got to tell you, some of us, we get real cocky when we season saints. We do. We get real cocky. We get a little Jesus swag. And the Lord's like, yo, I'm going to come like Jacob in the night, and you're going to be walking with a limp if you keep this up. Hey, Jacob, I'm in. Okay, seriously, we're going to wrestle. If you keep this up with your Jesus swag, I will make you dependent on me. And the reason is this. The reason is this, friends. Can I tell you the reason? The reason is, is because in that familiarity with it, we can get so smug. We can get so elitist about it. I've been walking with Jesus for so long that friends, some of us, we're so thirsty for a new word, but we were completely unfaithful with the last word. Some of us, I think the reason the Lord has us repeat scripture and service sometimes is because you know what? Our lives right now are the sum total of us just not getting it the first time. Right? Come on. Like, seriously, what would our lives look like if we got that word from heaven, we had that word in the wild, we went through the testing, we came out tried and true and full of grit, and we were ready to get after it for the Lord, right? but we didn't apply it. <laughs> that's a great word, God. Yes, that's for me. I love it. I need it today. And then you have the same problems and your life looks the same and we're having the same prayer circle for you after service and we're praying the same prayers and we're still walking around the walls of Jericho even though God was like, yo, if you just shut up and then talk when I tell you to talk and shout when I tell you to shout and blow the trumpet when I tell you to blow the trumpet, the walls would fall down. <laughs> so some of us, We've allowed the familiarity with Scripture to be fatal. Not because we didn't love it when we got it, but because we didn't apply it when we got it. And I just want to tell you this morning, 
the word unapplied is the word unfulfilled. When the word goes unapplied, the word goes unfulfilled. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? God, why does my life still look like this? And I'm going, still sleeping with your girlfriend? Well, yeah. <laughs> you know? Man, why are my finances still a wreck? Well, hey, you've been tithing? Well, no. You've been buying sneakers? Yeah, well, yeah. I, what are we doing? <laughs> like, we're, I love my B-I-B-L-E. It is the book for me in the moment. But it's, but, it's, but it's not the book for me in temptation. It's not the book for me in the testing. It's not the book for me in the wilderness. What the book for me is the lookbook, and I'm online going, this is going to be my new outfit. Like, I'm going to preach to anybody this morning. The word unapplied is the word unfulfilled. So don't prove yourself to be fatal this morning. Prove yourself to be faithful this morning. Don't prove yourself to be fatality. Be faithful this morning. God has a word for you today, a word for me today, and just because it comes out of a familiar place of Scripture doesn't mean that it doesn't have new life for you today. Amen? Come on, somebody. We're not looking for a new word. We're returning to an old word. We're going to be faithful with it. And gosh, friends, can I just tell you, some of us, we just didn't apply it the first time. So no shame. There's no shame in this house. There's no shame in this game. Let's start fresh today, and let's go after the word in the wild. Amen. But speaking of familiarity, man, when I said we were going to do a series called In the Wilderness, and it's called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, like, y'all should have seen some of your faces. Like, you clearly have spent some time outside recently, uh, dry, uh, thirsty, distraught, uh, determined to be angry at the Lord, and just confused and befuddled why your life is the way it is. Like, some of y'all, when I said, we're going to the wilderness, you were like, I just got back. <laughs> I wasn't ready. You know, like, we just, some of your faces were like, I don't, I don't want it. <laughs> like, you know. He just got done running a 5K, and I was like, let's go sprint. And you're like, I don't know. My shins are splinted, and I hate life. Like, that was some of our faces. But speaking of familiarity, man, I, what I find hilarious, and I mean hilarious, hilarious in its truest sense, like, where you can't, like, it's not that silly that it's funny, but you just can't help but laugh at the absurdity of it. You know what I'm saying? My wife always gets after me when I say the word uh, hilarious. She's like, Matt, that's not funny. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 I'm not saying it's funny. I'm saying it's so absurd because, you know, English language, uh, that you just can't help but laugh and go, huh? Like, like it's such a, a, a obscene moment. And you're just like, this, I can't help it. I'm just, yep, that's me, Lord, right here. Kind of looks like worship, but you're also confused. Um, it's good. And in this moment, here's Jesus. And if you don't know it, context is clarity. Context brings king. Come on, somebody, love it. Context is this. Jesus, in this moment, he's returning to the wilderness. After previously already being in the wilderness, being tested, tried, and true. And moments before this portion of scripture, Jesus just got done feeding 5,000 men and all of their wives and children. So anywhere from 12,000 to 15,000 plus people in total. That's what just happened in this moment. He just took some poor kid's sack lunch, got some loaves and fish, began to multiply it, did his thing, gave it to his homie, said, hey, you go spread this out, do your thing, chicken wing, and let's feed these hungry people so we can keep the revival service going. And it was amazing. And these people were filled with the Holy Spirit. These people were coming home to know Jesus. That Jesus was just standing there preaching to the masses this new revolution of the kingdom of heaven, the subversive kingdom that doesn't come to kick down Rome, but comes to take over Rome through relationship with Jesus. Amen? kind of like we finna do. Amen? But that's, that's what Jesus just got done doing. But instead of, you know what, I'm going to take a vacay. I just need a little personal day. I need a safe space. I need a self-care Saturday. Instead of self-care Saturday, Jesus doesn't go and get a facial. Jesus doesn't go get a mani-pedi with the boys. Okay, Scott. <laughs> I'm going to die. He's bigger than me. It's okay. My first thought was to say Calvin, and I knew I was dead. I knew. I was like, championship MMA fighter will kill me. 
and I'll, you know, I'll need my legs uh, healed after service. So, <laughs> but Jesus, <laughs> snarky. Uh, so Jesus, he gets done doing this amazing miracle, this amazing act of God. He does this incredible thing. And how many of you know he was probably exhausted? How many of you know he was probably tired? How many of you know he was over it at that moment? He was just, he, I mean, come on, he was fully God and fully man, and he just gave his entire, he poured out everything for these people. He emptied himself for this 15,000 people, for a miracle, for amazing things to happen, for revival to break out in this valley. He came, he showed up, he was God, and he left. But instead of savior care or self-care, he returned to the wilderness. Speaking of familiarity, you and I, we get done doing a great feat for God and we're like, where's the meat? That's me. I get done preaching and the last thing I'm thinking about is more fasting. I've been fasting all morning. I'm like, where is my steak? Bless you. You still ain't got healed them allergies yet? Come on, boy. This last week you need Kleenexes. This week you need Kleenexes. But that's the last thing I'm thinking about is going back into the wilderness. For you, Maybe God showed up in your workplace, or maybe you had a huge presentation, or maybe you led a family member to the Lord, or, or whatever it is, but something great with God happened in your life. Has anybody ever had something great with God happen in their life? And how many of you know the last thing you and I want to do in that moment is like, yeah, let's go back to the wilderness. Let's just, let's withdraw. Some of us, we think we preach this like it's some sort of... Um, amazing restful moment with Jesus where he puts up his hammock, he gets granola Grand Rapids about it, he has his Birkenstocks on, and he goes off and just frolics in the wilderness. Homie is not hunting mushrooms. He just emptied himself before his people, and now he's going to empty himself before his father. Like a championship fighter who just went 15 rounds, left with a title, Man, they might take a nap, but they are back in the gym the next day. Why? Because prize fighters win prizes. Prize fighters win prizes. And we are the type of church, we're prize fighters. We are God's prize, and we are his fighters. And we will run into the darkness of our world just to get one more, amen? And we will bring more prizes to our Father. Someone wanted a message on evangelism? There you go. You go into every dark lit corner of this city and you pull out one more. And then you go back. You just do it again. So Jesus, he goes off into the wilderness and being so familiar with it, you think he would just be benign to it. He would be like, I don't want this. I'm be pretty lethargic about it. Like, Lord, for calling me. No, no, no. Friends, can I just tell you something? Just real quick, can I be your pastor for a second? I'll get back to being a preacher in a second, but can I be your pastor for a second? Is that okay? Friends, the wilderness isn't optional. It's seasonal. <laughs> the wilderness isn't optional. It's seasonal. The testing of the Lord isn't optional. It's seasonal. The testing of the Lord is not optional. It is seasonal, friends. Because why? The, everything under the sun has a time place. There's a time for death. There's a time for life. There's a time for death. There's a time for resurrection. There's a time for training. There's a time for fighting. Amen. Training, wilderness, testing is not optional. It is seasonal. But can I free you up a little bit about that? Can I just get you a little bit more free today? Friends, you don't have to wait until the Lord decides you need more testing. You don't have to wait until the Lord in heaven decides to lean over his throne and be like, you know what? Uh, Matt, you're doing pretty good, but you, uh, you know what? I think you need a little more testing. <laughs> I think you need a little more sharpening. I think you're a little bit dull right now, Matt. You don't have to wait. These are the actual conversations the Lord and I have. You don't have to wait to be called into the wilderness. Friends, which student succeeds more with the teacher? The student that has to be pursued by the teacher or the student who throws themselves into the classroom? Friends, you must decide today, are you gonna be the pursued or are you gonna be the pursuer? Are you going to be the pursued or are you going to be the pursuer? God is always open for training, testing, and wilderness. He is all about building your life. He exists. 
His relationship, the whole purpose of going to the cross for his glory is worked out by building your life. He doesn't exist for you, but he wants to exist with you. And when God exists with you, he wants to build your life. And through that, build others. And so friends, don't wait for the Lord to come and have to correct you to turn you around, to tell you and remind you to repent, to say, hey, that one thing, that season, what you were up to, what you were getting into, don't wait for that moment with the Lord. Instead, let us show ourselves belly up and say, Lord, here I am. I submit to you fully. Send me again into the wilderness. Test me again, Father God. Don't wait, Jesus. It, this one didn't say he was drawn to the wilderness by the Holy Spirit this time. This just says Jesus decided to go. Who's going to subject themselves to more fasting after emptying themselves out? Jesus. And who's the perfect example of a life fully giving over to God's lordship and the governance of the Holy Spirit? Lord Jesus. So what are you and I called to do? Be like our big brother Jesus. Let's give ourselves over to testing. Let's decide today that we are going to be the pursuers of God, not the pursuit of God. He has already pursued us. He has already rescued us. He has already redeemed us. Let us now be the pursuers. Let's pursue him. Let's pursue people. Let's pursue our destiny. Let's pursue our calling. Let's pursue our spouses. Let's pursue our purity. Let's pursue what God has placed us on this earth to do. And friends, because it's 2022 and it has to be said, please let us pursue truth. So Jesus goes to the wilderness. And then his disciples go to a wilderness. You see, in the moment, uh, some of us, we, we think of the, of the wilderness as cactus, which are awesome. Not, so, not super friendly, but pretty to look at. We think of rattlesnakes. We think of rams, skulls, and horns. And we just think of, you know, Dirty Harry movies and Clint Eastwood. That's what we think wilderness is. Or Yellowstone. We think of that. But not every wilderness of life is dry. Sometimes it's incredibly wet. Not every wilderness with the Lord is peaceful. Sometimes it's quite often, it's very stormy. Not every wilderness is on land. Often they're at sea, they're in the ocean. Often, friends, the wilderness is found where you and I just feel, however, however it looks, whatever the ground you're standing on, whatever your journey is looking like, where you just feel lost and tossed. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? But we're not the lost and tossed today, are we? No, we are the loud and the found. Amen? Amen. Come on, somebody. But that is so often what it looks like. To be a follower of Jesus Man, God never promised us a safe journey. He just promises a safe landing place called heaven. Let me set you free today. The journey isn't safe. It wasn't safe for Jesus and it won't be safe for us. But friends, we will have a landing place called heaven. We will have a place where we are joined with the rest of the bride. It is called the church triumphant. The church triumphant. Amazing that they, uh, the early church didn't call a triumphant church one of 500 people. We made it! We hit 500, woo! No, the early church was like, we're in heaven, we're dead, we made it! Triumphant. And so Peter and the boys, they get in the boat, and they go out, and it says there's a storm. A storm is raging. And I love this portion of scripture because here we see the storm raging and it says that the wind is blowing and it's beating against the boat and all this stuff is just going in. It's just going down. The boat is taking a beating. And it says at the fourth watch, they, Peter got up and finally looked out and he saw the Lord. What strikes me about this moment in scripture, if we can pause right here, is that it says on the fourth watch, on the fourth watch, on the fourth watch, on the fourth watch. Why does that stick out to me? It sticks out to me 
Because so often, you and I, we are going through the storms of life, whether it's the Lord's testing or it's done because of our own stupidity. We messed up. We did this. We shouldn't have done this. The Lord told us to go here, but we went here instead. We were supposed to yam, and then we yammed. And like we messed up our whole lives, and we found ourselves in the wilderness, one away, either being led there by God or by our own inability to listen to the word of God. Amen? These are really the two ways. We either find ourselves in the wilderness by sin or by the Spirit. Those are really the only two ways. But however you found yourself in the storm, whether you were sent on ahead by Jesus, which how amazing is our God that he sent his disciples, he sends his people into a storm. He wasn't ignorant. He wasn't caught off guard. He was not surprised. He knew. So often we live this life feeling like we're caught off guard. We just took a left hook from Mike Tyson and we don't know what to do. And we didn't realize the Lord knew and he still sent you on ahead. It's because he's already seen it and he already knows and he's got a plan. On the fourth watch, so many of us, we go through storms of life we go through testing we go through wilderness and man i think some of us i think some of us will get up for the first watch we'll get up for the first watch we'll have we'll have a it's getting dark it's 9 p.m it's scary out the lightning's coming and clashing and and things are coming done done around you and and for whatever reason you started walking with the lord and this wheel fell off and this wheel fell off and this relationship fell off and this thing happened and, and someone stepped out in the marriage and whatever else like things start happening and some of us, we'll get up for the first watch. We'll go out in the middle of the storm for the first watch and start to look for the Lord, right? What does that look like? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, just found out I had an affair. Um, our marriage had an affair. Okay, I'm going to get the scripture today. Or we'll spend some time in worship today. Or we'll spend some time in prayer today. We might get in the boys and babe crew chat and we'll rally the troops around us the first time. The first part of the storm. The first moment whatever it may look like for you. Some of us, well, a lot of us, I think the majority of Christians on the earth today would wake up. And it says, I love it, because in order to get up in a boat, in order to get up and go out and go stand in the middle of a storm to look for God, to look to see the Lord is coming to your rescue, which is what prayer looks like. So funny, because they're in the middle of a storm. They would have had to get up. They would have had to put some slippers on. They would have had to get dressed for the occasion. They would have had to put a robe on. They would have had to get some protective gear on. They would have been going out because you're going to go back to bed after this. Friends, they, they actually had to do things. They actually had to get themselves up to go and look to see if the Lord was coming. But so often, we might do it the one time. The majority of us will do that the one time. Uh, then probably 50% of us will do it the second time. Or the second moment. Maybe it's the... Maybe it's the second day of darkness. Maybe it's the second hour in your life of, of the affair. Maybe it's the second moment where the business is going bottoms up. Maybe it's the second moment where you were called by God and you thought it was going to look different and then you found yourself still four hours into the darkest, deepest storm you've ever been in and you just feel throttled. You feel confused. And maybe, maybe you'd get up and check. Maybe you'd put on the robe of prayer. Maybe you put on the sandals of peace that God has prepared for you. Maybe you'll get into some worship. Maybe you'll go out into the storm. Maybe you'll go out into the eye of the storm and look up and try and see if God is moving, if he is listening, if he is there, if he even knows your situation. Maybe 50% of us would do it the second time. But the third time? Now we're getting a rarefied air. Because by the third time, the third check, the third hour, the third night, the third day, the third moment of the storm, the third throttling, the third shaking. I think a lot more of us are staying in that cabin. I think a lot less of us are getting out and going to look and seeing where our Lord is, seeing if he's still coming, seeking his face, asking him to show up. We are putting on a robe. There's like 15% of us that are getting out and going, God, where are you? I need you. Do you not see the storm around me, God? If you just would show up, this would stop. I know it would. God, last time you were here, you were asleep in the boat when this stuff was going on. Where? where? But I dare say, the majority of us, 
the vast majority of us, we're not waking up for the fourth watch. By this point, so many Christians have already thrown in the towel. So many Christians, we're just flailing. We just want to flail and flounder, and we want to kick our feet, and we want everybody else and God, everybody else to handle our situation, fix our situation, and do it for us. We don't want to get up and pray for ourselves. We don't want to get up and get in the Word. We don't want to put on a robe and get after it that day. We don't want to be a Christian, wake up, get out of the cabin, go stand in the eye of the storm, and say, yeah, it looks like all of hell out here, but I need heaven to interfere. Amen? Not many of us are open to this. Not many of us are willing to go and do this. But friends, what if I told you the wilderness will either create a fourth time tonight kind of prayer or a bitterness kind of prayer? A bitterness kind of prayer is where you stay in the cabin, where you stay mad, where you stay bitter, where you start reciting things about God, I knew you weren't real, I knew you didn't love me, I knew you didn't, I knew you were failure, I knew you wouldn't, nah, 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 nah. and that bitterness just takes root. And then the rest of us, the fourth night, the fourth time that night, those people, a prayer, a cry in the wilderness is birthed on the inside of them that is called travail. This is more than just a prayer. This is travailing. Travailing is less than, it's not just Jesus if you wouldn't mind. No, travailing is when you are so distraught, so discontent, so upset with your situation, in such disbelief of what is taking place, that faith in God rises to a level of which you're just saying, Jesus! Travailing is the prayer, it's the cry of the wilderness that is developed in you where you are saying, God, I won't make it unless you come. I won't make it unless you come. But it is the type of prayer that keeps you firm, that keeps you standing, that keeps you getting up at the fourth time when everyone else stays asleep in the cabin. When every other Christian remains asleep in the final hours, you are awake in the darkest midnight hour. And you are groaning before the Lord. Even if you can't get out another audible word, you're just, Jesus! And you choose to stand by living on your knees. Friends, this is mature Christianity. Mature Christianity is, I will stand on my knees. I will live on my knees. God, I will not be moved until you move. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? The wilderness will produce this. You will either be a bitter Christian or you will be a travailing Christian. You will be a Christian that's like, you know what? I'm not content with the prayer request on Sunday. I'm going to pray every single day. I'm going to fast until I see it. I'm going to go until God moves. I am going to remain. I'm not going to make, here we go. Want some practical preaching for you? I'm not going to make emotional decisions. I'm not going to make, I'm not going to make decisions based off temporal feelings and emotions. I'm not going to be moved until you move, God. I'm not going to move until you move, God. We just got done praying. I want to go where you go. I want to see what you see. Make me a shepherd, God. Well, a shepherd is not moved. So the Lord moves. And you got to love it because it's Peter. It's freaking Peter. It's not John, whom's the disciple, that self-proclaimed disciple whom Jesus loves. It's not Thomas, doubting Thomas. Oh my God, it's coming on outside. Oh, sweet Jesus, what's going on? It's not doubting Thomas. It's not Luke, the doctor. The most like logical one, it's Peter, the stupid one. Which I gotta say, as someone who has shares a lot of commonalities with Peter, sometimes it pays following Jesus to be stupid. Sometimes it pays to follow Jesus to be stupid. And I mean that, I mean that. Some of us, we've gotta get out of our logical box We've got to get out of our logical box. We cannot keep placing God in confines that he didn't place himself in. 
He gave us his word, friends. He gave us his word. That is the only confine he holds himself to is his word. God is not entitled to fulfill your dreams. He's entitled to fulfill his word. And his word is, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And Paul, uh, Peter is the only disciple in the fourth watch dumb enough to believe him. And guess what? That pays off. That pays off. And I love this because, friends, I just want to raise up a church that is so sold out for who we know Jesus to be because we've had time with Jesus that we trust Jesus by his word. Friends, I love this because Peter, the entire definition of his life post-salvation, post-meeting Jesus, you can read it time and time again, especially in Acts 4. Peter's known as the guy who's been with Jesus. Oh yeah, that's that rebel rouser, he's been with Jesus. Oh, the dude who pulled the Houdini act, getting out of prison? Yeah, he's been with Jesus. Oh, these dumb, uneducated boys? Yeah, Peter, he's been with Jesus. Like, Peter, his whole life post-following Jesus, getting to know Jesus, that moment is based off the fact that he's been with Jesus. Friends, mature Christianity is that people who've been with Jesus trust Jesus. People who've been with Jesus trust Jesus. I love this because this is that moment, friends, where Peter, he just knows. He knows Lord Jesus. He knows God. And he's like, man, Jesus wouldn't leave us like this. Jesus doesn't leave us hanging dry. That's not who we know him to be. The truest thing he knows about Jesus is that he is who he says he is, and he can do what he says he can do, and he's called all of us, and he wouldn't leave us here. He knows Jesus. Friends, can I say to you, that the wilderness will teach you to trust Jesus. The wilderness will teach you to trust Jesus. The wilderness will instill in you, if you will allow it, if you will subject yourself to the testing of God, if you will say to him, Lord, make me a vessel, make me like you, turn me into Jesus. When you do that, the first thing to becoming like Jesus is first trusting Jesus. None of you would ever open yourself up to become like someone you didn't trust. You wouldn't become a distrustful person. No, no, no. We open ourselves up to be made like Jesus because we first trusted Jesus. And Peter, God love him. He's not known for his stupidity. He's not known for the time he cut the guy's ear off. He's not known for denying Jesus three times. Not even, not even that. Peter is known for being the leader of the early church, the first pastor among many. He led the early church. He led the church in Rome that Paul wrote the letter of Romans to. Peter is known for being a man who has been with Jesus. And when you've been with Jesus, you will stay up all night in your storms. You will be the one going out to check. You will be the one saying, Lord, are you here yet? Has he come yet? Where are you? I am praying. I am seeking. You know he was on that boat in the eye of the storm going, Father, if you can hear me, send Jesus. Fourth time watch kind of cry is going to come out of this church cry of the wilderness is going to come out of this church because our world, friends, the cry that comes out of this wilderness will be our witness to our world. The cry that we develop in the wilderness will be our witness to the world. We will go and we will tell. We will tell them we have tasted and we have seen the goodness of God and his name is Jesus. He showed up for the, at the fourth hour, at the fourth watch, at the fourth time, right when I needed him. Friends, the next part, can I tell you this? next part of this situation, this moment. I love it. All of a sudden they see something off in the distance and it's walking on water. It is walking on water. As you know, Dowdy Thomas is like, it's a ghost! And then Peter's like, nerd. You gotta keep them in their place, okay? And they see Jesus. And they're scared. They're in fear. Friends, can I just kind of tell you today, if you're looking for God, don't be surprised when he shows up like God. 
when you're praying to God to show up, don't be surprised when he shows up like God. God is all about showing off his power. Contrary to popular uh, belief, contrary to West Michigan Christianity, contrary to kind of how America has done Christianity for the last 200 years, like contrary, okay, Jesus, another time he set the, the disciples on ahead was when he was leaving and he said, yeah, yeah, wait here for uh, days on end until the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be filled with power. Why? Because our God loves to show off. Our God loves to show off. Our God loves to show up and show out in our moments and in our seasons. And he loves to just give you a testimony to go and tell your friends about. He loves to go and tell you about this worship service we just had today. Man, I'm about to go to a conference with other pastors where I'm going to get filled up. And I'm sitting here going, I don't know if anything's going to compare to this moment. No offense. This moment today wrecked me. I'm not a crier. I was in tears. First song. (laughs) That's a hype song. Who gets tearful in a hype song? I hope someone who's been with Jesus. And so when God shows up in power, don't be surprised when God shows up in power. Some of us, we are expecting this, this, this cautious, the dainty, weak Jesus. No, when you ask for the power of God, expect to see the power of God. It might be on the fourth watch, but expect to see the power of God. Amen. I want a church that just lives from a place, again, of, of, of ecclesia potent, that is a church expecting to see the power of God. Friends, I got to tell you, I don't know what the last two years have looked like for you, but I know it's shaken our planet. I know it's shaking our culture. I know it's shaking our nation. And I know it's shaking a lot of people. And not just because of the politics, but because of work, because of family, because of deaths, because of disease, because of all sorts of things. This world has been shaken like a snow globe in the last two years. And I got to tell you, friends, God is more powerful. Just like this. He is walking on the water. Why? To show creation, you don't rule me. To show his disciples, look at me. He always exercises in power to show his people his power. Friends, God is more powerful than the government. God is more powerful than culture. God is more powerful than your boss. God is more powerful than your calling. God is more powerful than it's working against you. God is more powerful than you. God is more powerful than the storms around you. God is more powerful than the confusion you're experiencing. God is all powerful. Amen? Amen. He is all powerful. You don't have a limited savior. You have a total savior. You don't have a limited king. You got the king of kings. You don't have a limited Lord. You have the Lord of lords. He is all powerful. And I love when he just decides to flex his God muscles and he walks in the ways. He could have showed up in the boat. He could have just appeared. But God wants you. He he always shows off in power to his people to build your faith. And it was at this moment, I love this moment, I freaking love this moment. Why? Because we get all confused about this moment. We really do. We really do. I love the walking on the water. You see, Peter, he's been with Jesus. He has been with Jesus, and he knows somebody else is going, it's a ghost. And Peter's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Jesus. I, yeah, I ain't seen nobody else. We ran across some demoniac guys, and they weren't walking on water, okay? We, we saw the one, remember that time with the guy and the pigs and the whole thing? They fell off the cliff okay they didn't ride on the they didn't walk on the air they went off the cliff like i'm pretty sure this is jesus and i love this moment because jesus (laughs) what he says here is the most baller statement of all time and we completely miss it every time we have completely missed it every time and i know it's because i have completely missed it every time they're scared it's a ghost thomas you know he's wetting his pants everyone else is stoked peter's like let's go it's jesus and i love this jesus says take heart It is I. Do not be afraid. Eight words. Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Or don't be afraid. Take heart. It is I. Don't be afraid. I love this moment. I love this. Why? Because this is when Jesus disciples his disciples. This is when Jesus gets his pastor game on. This is when Jesus, he sets your eyes right. Come on, somebody. I love this part. Because Jesus, the first thing he says is take heart. They are scared. They're in the storm. Some of them have stayed asleep. Peter is geeked. Thomas is wetting his pants. And Jesus just says, take heart. First thing he says, why? 
Because God's saying, no, 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 get your eyes off the storm and get your eyes on me. Take heart, fix your eyes on something above. The first thing he does is he points to where your faith is not and he puts it where it should be. First thing he says is take heart, take heart, have some resolve. Strengthen yourself in the Lord, fix your gaze upon me, lift your eyes to a higher level. Yeah, I get there's some mischief going on in the United States and governments and all this stuff. Get your eyes up here. I know COVID's a big deal, but get your eyes up here. I know your bank account is low, but get your eyes up here. Take heart. I know your marriage is on the rocks. Take heart. Get your eyes up here. Lock eyes with me. And I love it. Because again, Jesus flexes his God muscles. He says, it is I. What am I getting my eyes on? You're getting your eyes on me. What are you? It is I. I who? I am. I who? I am. I who, I am, as in great I am, as in I am, I was, and I will be again, as in I am forever, as in I am. Come on, somebody, we serve the God who is still the great I am. And so you know when he tells you, get your eyes off the waves and get them on him, why? Because he is a total, all-powerful God. I am. It is I. It is I I just treated these waves like a stairmaster to exercise your faith. It is I. And then what's he do? Well, like a good pastor, this is the moment he corrects you. He says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. I love this because this is the moment where he decides to correct behavior. I love it. The first thing he says isn't correction first thing he says is fix your eyes what are you looking at what are you putting in what are you doing what are you focusing on fix your eyes take heart that's what that means resolve take heart look at me look to me and then he tells you who he is he says i'm jesus am i preaching to anybody this morning he says just don't call it a comeback i ain't never left i'm gonna remind you just who the heaven i am i'm jesus I wish more Christians would realize he's Jesus. And then he corrects. So friends, when your pastor or spiritual leader in your life, just see now, tells you to fix your eyes, take heart, have some resolve, strengthen yourself in the Lord, and then they remind you who Jesus is, and then they tell you to quit sleeping with your girlfriend, Maybe you don't start deconstructing your faith because he has some correction, but instead realize, oh, my pastor's just being like Jesus. I love it. In the middle of a bloody storm of all places, on a boat. <laughs> and then this happens. This is the word in the wild. Are you ready for the word in the wild? Woo-hoo. You see, we get, this, we get this moment so confused because Peter, he goes, Jesus, if it is you, Lord, Command me to walk on the water, and I will walk out to you. And Jesus, with the fourth watch of the night, has a four-letter response to all of this. And he says, come, come, come. I just felt like some of us this morning, we needed to hear the Lord invite us back. I felt like some of us today needed to know the Lord's calling is still for you. Just come. The Lord still has a word for you. It's come. I don't know what that looks like and how that has walked out in all of your lives and in every situation, but I know that it's still alive and active today. It is the word come. So come. Amen. Because here's the deal. We miss the miracle in this moment. You see, Peter hears the Lord Jesus say come. And Peter, being Peter, being awesome, not stupid, but awesome, slightly stupid, gets out of the boat and begins to walk on the water. And I think some of us, were so familiar with the scripture that we just go, we just go, oh yeah, isn't that a nice Bible story? Isn't that a nice miracle? Isn't it nice that God used to do things like that? I mean, I wish God would do things like that today. Like, isn't that cool? Like, isn't that a cool moment with the Lord? Like, wow, could you imagine being there? Wow, I wish God would do things like that today. That was a really cool moment. And that's how we approach this moment. Friends, I believe, literally, hear me. You might leave church after this. You might try and get your tithe back. I don't know. I firmly believe if the Lord calls you to it, you could walk on water. I do. I do. 
Just like I firmly believe, he tells you, you can go into all the world, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. The problem for many of us isn't that we don't believe the scripture. We hear the words walking, uh, we hear the, we don't believe the walking on water. That's not the issue. We hear about Peter walking on the water. We're like, well, yeah, of course, Jesus is there. Jesus said, come, of course. The problem isn't that we don't believe in the miracle. It's a problem that we have a problem applying God's word. You see, there's something called the logos, which is the written word of God. And there's something called the rhema, which is the spoken word of God. Logos, written, spoken, rhema. Both equal in power, but only upon application. <laughs> For my guys in the back. I got you. Logos, written, rhema, spoken, both equally powerful, but only upon application. Friends, we miss it. We miss it. We miss it because our day and age, so many of us, we go, I have a personal relationship with Jesus. The problem is we've put it to settings on private. So many of us, we've got a personal relationship with Jesus, but we have a very private relationship with Jesus. So much so that most of us, we could leave this four walls of this church and so many Christians, so many people wouldn't even know that we're Christians, let alone that we can cast out demons. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? Come on, somebody. We are going public with this thing again. We are going public with this thing again. And so what happens is, is Peter isn't walking on water. I mean, of course he is. That's awesome. But that's not the miracle. The miracle isn't that Jesus was walking on water. The miracle isn't even that Peter was walking on water. The miracle that takes place in this moment is that the God of the universe could have a God of the universe word for your life and a Christian would hear it and then actually obey it. That's the miracle. The miracle's not, I'm gonna walk on water. You know, like whatever that worship song is that came out two years ago. That's, That's not the miracle. Of course it's entirely possible. Just like casting out a demon or cleansing lepers or raising the dead is completely possible. Anything is possible with God. Amen? Of course that's possible. The miracle is that the God of the universe could speak his word and a Christian would actually apply it. A Christian would actually obey it. A Christian would actually go, you know what? I'm pretty sure this guy right now that I spent some time with, ah, he's not doubting. He's not deconstructing. He's not running away. He's not tearing it down from white nationalism Christianity. He's going, you know what? Actually, uh, God did say that, didn't he? All right, well, I'm going <laughs> to. And Peter begins to walk on the water. The miracle here is that Peter got a word in the wild, and Peter didn't walk on the water. He walked on the word. So many of us, what would our lives look like if we, if we stopped waiting for this crazy, miraculous moment and we decided to pick up the most miraculous part where Christians and humans actually believed God and began to walk on God's word? The miracle is walking on the word of God, not on the waves beneath their feet. All things are possible with God. We got Christians who avoid the puddles of life. God is not going to let you walk on the ocean, okay? Okay. He's going to call you to deep waters, though. And it's in those moments you got to decide, am I really going to get out of this boat? Am I going to worship team? You can make your way up here. I'm going to get out of this boat of security, this refuge that I made for myself, this fortress that I've made for myself. This is my security. This is my safety. I have designed all of this myself. The crazy thing about Peter being the one to walk on the water, the crazy one thing about Peter being the guy to get up four times at night and remain, is that Peter's the fisherman out of the group. You know how many storms Peter's been in on a boat? You know how many nights out at sea he's felt lost and tossed and distressed? Do you know how many times he almost sank because of the waves and the storms? Do you know how many times he was out there? This is normal for Peter. Out of anybody, he should have been the most equipped for this moment. But he wasn't resting in his previous knowledge. He was resting in his relationship with Jesus. You see, friends, No matter what season you're going through, whether you've had wilderness seasons before, once you've had Jesus, you don't want to go through the wilderness without him. Once you've had Jesus, you don't want to go through a storm without him. 
you might be so equipped with some sort of survivor mentality like I am, where you know what, I can survive anything. I was raised in hell. I can survive anything. I can switch off my emotions. I become a complete sociopath. I put my nose to the grindstone and I just get through life. That's me. But once you've had Jesus, you don't want to be a sociopath. You don't want to be unemotional. You don't want to just grin and bear it. No, you want to praise and hear it. You want Jesus in the water with you. You want Jesus to be your safety, not your boat. You want Jesus to be in the storm of life, even though you are well equipped for the storms of life. You might have a financial issue, but have all the money in the world, and you should still want the Lord to show off in your finances. Why? Because he's all powerful and your money is not. He's all powerful and your marriage is not. He's all powerful and your calling is not. He is all powerful and you are not. No matter how equipped you may feel for the life ahead of you, it's still the Lord that determines your steps. And it's still the Lord that calls you out of the boat and onto the water. But it all starts and begins and ends with his word and whether you are going to obey it or not. And I love this moment as you guys begin to stand up with me. We're going to worship our hearts out. You see, in this moment of following Jesus out into the water, I think we've all heard this moment before. Peter gets a little shook, like a lot of us have. I think a lot of us in the last two years had a lot of things happen where we felt like we knew the Lord, we knew our calling, we knew the word in the wilderness, we thought we knew what he had for us. And and then a lot of things happened this last two years. A lot of things are happening this week for people in our church. I think a lot of us have gone through areas of life where we're like, man, I just did not see this coming. I had a word and I thought it was going to go one way. And here's my reality. And I think it's easy in that moment we begin to look to the left and to the right. And we begin to see the storms and we see the bank statements and we see the, the, the hospital bills and we start seeing all these things and hospice is called and whatever else and it's just we start seeing how this is going and down and suddenly we forget to take heart we were so certain when we first got out in that word of God we started walking on the word we started walking in our calling and, 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 and we started the business and we started the, the Instagram page and we started the marriage we started all these things we were so certain we had taken such heart we had fixed our eyes on Jesus and we walked accordingly. But sometimes, like happens to all of us, myself included, more times than I want to admit, I can get out on these waters of leading a church and planning a church. And I can look at our bank account and I can look at our building and I can look at our staff and I can look at all the things that are going right and going wrong. And I can start to take my my eyes off the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and I can start to put it on the giving at Planning Center and, 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 and QuickBooks and, and I can take it off and I just start getting tilted and, and tossed and thrashed and suddenly, much like Peter, I begin to sink. But the word in the wild isn't just the word that Jesus had, it's the word that came out of Peter. You see, all of us are going to do this. God's not unaware of our struggles. But much like Peter, we need to understand that it's better to sink with Jesus than to sink without Jesus. See, Peter has been with Jesus. Peter knows Jesus. Peter has done so much with Jesus, lived so much life with Lord Jesus. And so even when he begins to sink, even in the moment of doubt, even in the moment of fear, he still has on his tongue, Jesus, save me. word comes from Peter and it goes up to heaven and it goes back to Jesus and Jesus reaches out and he grabs Peter and he rescues him. Mature Christianity is even when you fail, you're still singing Jesus save me. And then another miracle happens. Because the way it actually ends, if you want to throw that last scripture up, the way it actually ends is, and they got back in the boat, and they worshiped Jesus, proclaiming he is the Son of God. 
it says, and then they got back in the boat. And they got back in the boat. It doesn't say that Jesus carried his butt back on the waves and because we don't know how far out they got. They probably got pretty far. He said, Lord, come to me and I will come out on the waves and I will come to you. So he probably got pretty far and earlier said he was off in a distance. So we, this isn't like he got out and got three steps in. No, Peter made a distance. And then it says they got back in the boat. It doesn't say that Jesus picked him up and carried him across the threshold of an ocean. No, no, no. When you get back in alignment with God's word for your life, when you get back in alignment with the word, when you start and you say, Jesus, save me, and he sets you back on firm foundation, firm foundation being his word in the wilderness for your life, you begin to walk again on the word. Peter wasn't tossed overboard back into the boat. He got back in the boat with Jesus, a.k.a. he started walking on the word again. So I don't know what life's looked like for you. I don't know where you've been. I know a lot of people in our, in our sphere today, in our church today, our family today, has had a crazy week. There's been a lot going on. But what I'm telling you is this. You can get back up with Jesus. You proclaim, Jesus, save me. He will lift you back up. He will place you back in a place, in a position where you can again begin to walk on his word in obedience, in faithfulness, in joy. You could be soaking wet from your mistakes and you could still come back into the boat and find yourself soaking wet but able to worship Jesus. So I don't know what your mess has looked like. And I don't know what song we're about to sing. Oh, we're going to sing Sea of Victory. How fitting. But I know that you can get back in with Jesus. Soaking wet from your sinking. And you can still see a victory. So right now as the worship team begins to sing, as we go into this song, I just want to invite you. Lift your hands. Worship Jesus as you are, where you are, in your current predicament, in your current circumstances, in your current situations. Right now, begin to ask again for God to give you that word, to set you back up to where you can walk on word, to where you will not be throttled, you will not be thrashed, but you will walk confidently. You will fix your eyes again, and you will remember the great I am is all-powerful above every other circumstance and situation. So worship team, begin to lead us to that place of seeing a victory, of fixing our eyes on Jesus. And as I pray right now, we're just gonna begin to close our eyes and lift our hands, and we're gonna begin to proclaim, Jesus, save me. Jesus, save my marriage. Jesus, save my purity. Jesus, save my finances. Jesus, save my heart. Jesus, save my doubt. Jesus, save our relationship, God. I don't wanna leave you. I wanna know you. Would you save me again, God?